Well, as we come to the end of the Christmas season, we are spending one last week looking at some of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. You know, Bible scholars have um, identified more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that they connect to Jesus. The Jesus Film Project tells about a mathematician who studied the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of these prophecies, much less all of them. Listen to what they said. Peter Stoner, chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena College, was passionate about biblical prophecies. With 600 students from the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Stoner looked at eight specific prophecies about Jesus. They come up with extremely conservative probabilities for each one of them being fulfilled. And then they considered the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling all eight of those prophecies. This is what he said. They said, the conclusion to his research was staggering. The prospect that anyone would satisfy those eight prophecies was just one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, it's hard to have an appreciation for how big 10 to the 17th power is. And so Peter Stoner described it like this in his book, Science Speaks. Let's try to visualize this chance, 1 in 10 to the 17th power. If you mark 1 of 10 tickets and place all the tickets in a hat and stir them thoroughly and then ask a blindfolded man to draw, draw 1, his chance of drawing the marked ticket is 1 in 10, right? Now, suppose that we take 10 to the 17th power silver coins. And we lay them across the face of Texas. They would be two feet deep all across the state. Now, mark one of those silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Then blindfold a man and tell him he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up the one silver dollar that's the right one that is marked. What would be the chance of his getting the right one? Well, it would be the same chance that the prophets had of writing these eight prophecies and having all of them come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing that they only wrote using their own human wisdom. The mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of them, let alone all of them, is staggeringly improbable, maybe even impossible. So over the last six weeks, we have looked at prophecies that foretold that Jesus would be born to crush evil, that he would be born of a virgin, that when he was born, he would be called Emmanuel, God with us that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born as a shoot from the stump or the lifeline lineage of Jesse, and that he would be born a king, and when he was born, he would be called and recognized as the light of the world. That's seven. Today is the eighth prophecy that we have chosen. And this prophecy is not directly related to Jesus' birth, but it is directly related to Christmas. Because at Christmas time, we not only celebrate Jesus' first coming 
as a baby, but we recognize and anticipate his return, his second coming that we are still waiting for. Jesus came into the world the first time as a baby who grew to be a sinless man who was crucified, buried, raised, and ascended to heaven for our sake to be our, our, uh, our uh, intercessor in heaven. But before he had ever taken his first breath on earth, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born to return again. This second time as a triumphant king who would bring his kingdom to completion. So let's go back this time to about 550 B.C., where God gave Daniel, and that's the same Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den, where God gave Daniel visions about things that would happen in the future and have, and visions about other things that would happen in the future, and we are still waiting for them to happen. In chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, Daniel had a vision about these four mighty and terrifying creatures who represented the rise and the fall of four kings or kingdoms in history. And it's generally agreed that those beasts represent the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Greek Empire, and then the greatest of all, the Roman Empire, which lasted for a thousand years. And toward the end of Daniel's vision, he saw one little horn grow out of that fourth beast. And the horn had teeth of iron and claws of bronze and human eyes and an arrogant and boastful mouth. And this little horn grew big and destroyed other rulers. Now, as we've mentioned before in this series, God often used Old Testament prophecies and visions to foretell something that would happen in the near future and also in the distant future. People have likened Old Testament prophecy to looking at a mountain range. Have you ever stood at a distance and looked at what you thought was a mountain, and then as you got closer to it, you realized that there was another mountain right behind it, and you were actually seeing two mountains, and they were separated by a valley? Well, in a like way, Old Testament prophecy is sometimes like looking at two mountains, and the valley in between is the separation of time between the fulfillment of the first and the second time of the prophecy. So some scholars looking at the historical evidence think that the first fulfillment of this prophecy was about the, um, the little horn was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was a wicked and tyrannic, tyrannical king who defied God who defiled the temple, and who persecuted and killed anybody who remained faithful to God. But it's probable that that little horn with the big mouth also refers to the Antichrist, who is going to rise up in the end times as the final human dictator. And it fits with other scripture that talks about the Antichrist, including the book of Revelation, where the Antichrist is characterized there also by his boastful and blasphemous mouth. Well, verse 11 of Daniel 7 describes how God will one day silence, judge, and destroy that little horn with the big mouth. And then Daniel goes on in verse 13 to speak about the one who is going to come and will be given eternal dominion over all the earth. It's the story of how our world is going to transition from human dominion, dominion where we have failed miserably to divine dominion where the world that we have destroyed is going to be made right again 
forever. So Daniel wrote this in the seventh chapter, beginning with verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this being is described as one like the Son of Man. And that title, Son of Man, is used in two different ways in Scripture. First, it's used to distinguish mere human beings from God. And so we hear it in the book of Psalms, and we hear it in the book of Ezekiel. As a matter of fact, it's used more than 90 times to refer to Ezekiel as a mere human being. But that title is also used to describe someone who is much greater than a mere human being. And these two verses that we just read in Daniel 7 are filled with images that show us that this is who Daniel was seeing, someone who is much greater than just a mere human being. This son of man dwells with the ancient of days. He is coming with the clouds of heaven, which is a sign of divine authority. The ancient of days gives him authority, glory, and sovereign power. No one has all of those attributes apart from God. All nations and peoples worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. The only kingdom that will never be destroyed. You know, Jesus used Son of Man as a title to refer to himself more than he used any other title. It's used more than 80 times times in the four Gospels. One example is in Matthew 8 where a scribe approached Jesus and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go, which was highly unusual in the first place for a scribe. But then Jesus responded by warning him that if he did that, it would not be an easy or a comfortable life. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The decision to follow Jesus was not, is not an easy decision today either. And so as we end this series, each one of us has to make two decisions that will have a profound impact on what we believe and how we live our lives. The first is to decide what we believe about the trustworthiness of Scripture. For the past six weeks, we've looked at eight Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, eight predictions about his birth and the purpose of him coming to our world. Seven of them have already come true. We are waiting for the day when the eighth will be fulfilled, when Jesus will come again to restore this world and bring his eternal kingdom to completion. So as you process what you have learned about these prophecies in the last six weeks, you're going to have to decide whether you believe that what is written in the word of God is true and can be trusted or whether these prophecies are just random, unrelated statements or lucky guesses. 
Either the God of the cosmos orchestrated these prophecies to show us his power and his plan, or a blindfolded man walked through two feet of silver coins across the whole state of Texas, reached down and picked up that one coin that was marked. You decide which is easier to believe. Daniel doesn't tell us the name of that being he saw in his vision who dwells with the ancient of days. But we do know from Daniel that he is coming with divine authority, riding on the clouds of heaven. And more than 500 years after Daniel saw that vision, the Apostle Paul named the one who would come in authority on the clouds. He wrote to the early Christians in Thessalonica who were discouraged because they believed that Jesus was going to return during their lifetime and now believers were starting to die and Jesus had not yet returned. And so they didn't know how to practice, process that fact. So Paul wrote his first letter to reassure them beginning with verse 13 in chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first." After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The consistent message of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is coming again. And it is also consistent with the Old Testament prophecy of Daniel. So the first decision you have to make is whether or not to believe the claims of Scripture are true and can be trusted. The second decision is about whether you're going to believe the claims of Jesus. We live in frightening times. I believe that scripture tells us that the world is going to grow very dark before Jesus returns, but I would never try to predict the day or the time when Jesus is going to return. Others have been trying to do it ever since Jesus promised he would return, and no one has been right yet. But I do know that each day we are one day closer to his return. And as we enter into 2022, we are one year closer to his return. And as I look around our world, it just feels like we are getting closer. I am often overwhelmed by the evil, the terror, the sin, and the despair in our world. I don't know how to process each new disaster, each new tragedy, each new heartbreak. I get overwhelmed, but I'm not surprised because scripture has been telling us what will happen for thousands of years. Jesus himself said in Luke 21, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. 
On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. But then in the midst of that terror, Jesus continues with this promise. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. There it is again. Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus referred to himself with that title, the Son of Man, people who heard Jesus use that title had to decide for themselves whether they believed he meant he was a mere human being or whether they believed he was the glorious, sovereign, and eternal king who is described in Daniel 7. Each of us has to decide what we believe about that as well. Because the Son of Man, whom Daniel saw in his vision, coming with the clouds of heaven to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and never pass away, is going to return just as Daniel foretold. And the only way that we will be ready, the only way that we will be able to endure, the only way that we will be able to stand up and lift up our heads and encourage one another is if we believe that the word of God and the claims of Jesus are true. We have spent the last six weeks traveling back to the future so that we could all become more confident about the trustworthiness of the Bible and the claims of Jesus and God's plans for our lives and the world. Let it be so. Pray with me. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. There will be justice, all will be new, your name, God, forever, faithful and true. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your fame. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, even so, come, Lord Jesus, Son of Man, come. Let it be so. Amen.